We love to wonder, don't we? As people created in the image of God, we have the capability of thinking. And we find ourselves thinking highly of moments in our lives that brought us to a sense of awe, that brought us to a sense of amazement. If I were to ask you, what causes you to wonder? I bet your answers would be quite varied, quite diverse. Maybe you saw a band with an incredible musician, an incredible vocalist, and you wondered, how in the world could somebody sing that well? How in the world could somebody play an instrument that good? Or maybe a sporting event causes you to wonder. Maybe it's a championship game, and having attended or seen that game leaves you in a sense of amazement that that just happened. That individual caught the ball, made the shot, threw the pass. The team came back from uh, lots of points behind to come back and win the game. Maybe, maybe that causes you to wonder. Or maybe it's something different. Maybe it's theatrical. Maybe it's a, a Broadway play. Maybe it's a show. Or maybe it's a musician that, that leaves you thinking, how was that put together? It leaves us scratching our heads. Or maybe you like movies. Maybe a movie causes you to wonder. The plot line, the cinematic effects, they leave you thinking, how in the world did somebody come up with that? Or maybe what causes you to wonder is something different. Maybe it's not something that a man or a woman can do or think of or create or mold. Maybe what causes you to wonder is what God and God alone can do. Maybe it's going to the mountains. Maybe it's a place like the Grand Tetons out west. Maybe it's mountains that bring wonder into your life. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's the sea. I could look at that picture forever. Maybe it's the sea that causes you to wonder. How vast and how deep is the ocean? And the fact that God has it stop right where we can enjoy it, in relatively the same place on land. That causes me to wonder how the moon helps with the tides or how we haven't even found, after this many years on the earth, we haven't even found everything, every animal, every creature, every living thing that the ocean contains. That causes me to wonder. Maybe for you it's, it's a loved one that causes you to wonder. It's the way that that God intervened in their lives and and healed somebody of something that is only explainable through an act of God. You know, we could go on and on during our time together, but the point of our time is this. Wonders cause us to wonder. Wonders cause us to wonder. And during our time together, we're going to see just how God used signs and wonders to build his church and draw people to himself. And then afterwards, we're going to answer two questions. And those questions are right here. One, has God always worked in this way? We see the phrase signs and wonders a lot in the book of Acts. And so that leads us to ask the question, has God always worked in this way? Has he always used signs and wonders for building his kingdom? Or instead, is this something that God kind of incorporated and brought in into the New Testament? That's our first question we'll talk about. The second is this, does God still work in this way today? Does God still use signs and wonders to get our attention, to further his agenda, to point people towards himself? Does God still do so? So our text today is Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. Just a short passage during our time together. And the Bible says this in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 12. The Bible says, Now many signs and wonders were done regularly among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick to the streets and laid them on cots and mats as Peter came by. At least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful 
for this time that we have together. Lord, we're grateful for the wonders that you've put in our lives and those things that you've done that point us to you. Father, we're grateful for the the wonder that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. But Lord, we are amazed. He didn't stay dead. Lord, you brought him back to life three days later to prove to us that there's life after death. There's meaning, there's purpose after this short life, these short years that we have here on earth. So Father, I pray during our time together, that you will cause us to wonder from what we hear from your spirit through your word. Father, speak during this time, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what we've just read in the book of Luke is called a pericope. A pericope is something that Luke uses several times in the book of Acts, and it is a summary of the current conditions uh, in the church that introduce a narrative that follows. So a pericope is a time where, where we, Luke zooms out from the text and kind of gives an overview of what's taking place in different parts of the text. He kind of zooms back out, gives us a thousand foot view of what's taking place uh, within the church, within, within the people of God. And it usually introduces something that Luke is going to zoom back into uh, and, and dive right in and, and flesh out. And so the first pericope we saw in the book of Acts was in P- after Peter's first sermon in Jerusalem. Yet Peter's first sermon, and then Luke zooms out of that scene and then talks about what the church is doing. And in Luke chapter 2, verses 42 through 46, Luke says the church was going to the temple each day. And then after we zoom back into to the, the passages after that, we see that Peter and John are, are going to the temple. They're doing what, what Luke kind of said they were about to do and, and the church was currently doing. The second pericope in the book of Acts is at the end of chapter 4 in verses 32 and, and 35, right before chapter 5 with two that we've just learned about, Ananias and Sapphira. This pericope shows that the church had everything in common. And then we zoom into Acts chapter 5 and we see that there were two that did not act that way. And so our text today, this pericope, is going to explain what happens in a later text when the Sadducees become so jealous of what's taking place in this fledgling church that they arrest not only Peter and John, but the other apostles as well. And the reason they do so, as as we see right here, is because the apostles, the church, the the people of the way, this is gaining a great influence, not only in Jerusalem, but in outlying areas all around the region. And while Acts chapter 3, when when John and Peter healed this lame man outside of Solomon's portico, outside the temple, that triggered a little bit of opposition. We're starting to see here in Acts chapter 5 that numerous people are being healed. And those against the gospel, those against the church, would soon do something about that. So let's dive in and see what's taking place behind each of the lines here in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 12. Verse 12 says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. Now, if you remember earlier in our study, this phrase, signs and wonders, is one that Peter used in in his first sermon in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Peter says, Now, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works, wonders, and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Peter takes one verse in Acts chapter 2 to remind the crowd that they had three years of evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. The, and the crowd in Jerusalem, they knew that Jesus was different, and these signs proved the fact. And then Peter names three specific things here. I want to go over briefly. Mighty works and wonders and signs, and they all mean different things. We need to be reminded of this. When Peter says mighty works, when you see the phrase mighty works in Scripture, that is a miracle. A mighty work is a supernatural work that Jesus did. And this should be no surprise that a, the supernatural one did supernatural works. John MacArthur says this should come as no surprise if the God who supernaturally created the universe should choose at times to supernaturally intervene in it. Amen. And these works that Jesus did, they pointed to the fact that he was the son of God. 
But many who were around Jesus during his time on earth, they got tied up in, in the works. They got tied up in the things that they did, and they missed what those things were pointing to, namely that he was the Son of God, that he was the Savior, that he was the Lord. So that's mighty works. When you see the word wonders, like we see in our text today, a wonder is a reaction. A wonder is what takes place in somebody's mind and their thoughts after they see a mighty work. It's a marveling that takes place. It's an amazement that takes place in, in your minds, in your hearts. And the gospel is full of occasions where people around Jesus marveled at him. And now in the book of Acts, people are mar still marveling at the work that Jesus is doing. But the work that Jesus is doing is through his spirit, through the apostles that are taking the good news all throughout Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Finally, we see the word signs here. A sign is a work of God. It's a work of God that proves either who God is or proves that Jesus is God. If you remember in the life of Jesus, we saw a number of signs of God. We saw uh, an audible voice that God spoke at, at Jesus' baptism. And at, at his crucifixion, we saw a number of of signs, the darkened sky, the earthquake, uh, the, the veil of the, the curtain tearing from top to bottom, a number of signs that prove that this was the Messiah. In the book of Acts, we see a number of signs still taking place. God starting, continuing this work through his disciples, his apostles. We see God reversing kind of what took place in Babel in, in early, the early parts of Genesis when People are hearing the word preached and proclaimed in multiple languages through these unlearned men who are the apostles. We see in Acts chapter 3 a man who's crippled from birth being instantly healed through an encounter that he had with Peter and John. And so that's what's continuing to take place. The word tells us that there's still mighty many signs and many wonders that are regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. So now we know what Luke means when he says that signs and wonders took place around the young church. And one cool thing that we need to note is that these signs and wonders are actually an answered prayer that the church prayed earlier in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 4 verse 30, Peter and John are just released from jail. They go back and they meet the church and they're praying to God, offering him thanksgiving and they're asking God to continue to do the work that he's already started and continue to do that work through them. In Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 30, the Bible says this, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders. There's those words. Signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The apostles knew that God through his spirit, is working through them with signs and wonders. And their boldness is evident in the fact that they're not only performing signs and wonders, they're telling people why these things are taking place, what these signs and wonders are pointing to. And there's some persecution and some interesting things taking place among all of this. Let's continue on. Verse 13, the Bible says this, Now none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Now, we need to take a little bit of time to flesh these verses out because an initial reading at this, it may seem like these, these two verses contradict one another. None of the rest joined them, wanted to join them, but multitudes were added to their number. That, that might seem like a contradiction, but it's not. And in order to understand what's taking place here, we need to look back just a little bit at something that recently took place in the life of the church. We talked about that second pericope that Luke, Luke had in Acts chapter 4, where he was talking about how everybody in the church had everything in common. You remember that? Now, it's not, now this is not a forced or mandated sharing of resources. This having everything in common is a free decision by those in the church that they wanted to share with what, what they had with others around them who didn't have everything that they had. It's a free decision by those that realize that the Lord has graciously blessed them during their times of need, and therefore 
They should graciously bless others or freely do the same thing for others. Just think about what the church could look like if we rightly understood and practiced this today. There'd be no need for a benevolence offering. For There'd be no need for the, the church office to hear or take care of a need because the time the office heard about somebody who had a need, somebody or, or a group in the church would have already met that need. That's what's taking place here in the book of Acts. And in chapter 4, verse 36, the Bible tells us about a man named Joseph called Barnabas. And he sold a field and he brought all of the proceeds to the apostles' feet. Now this was something that he probably did in public because there were several who took notice of this and praised God for it. But there was a couple who took notice of this and kind of wanted to, to have that same praise directed towards them. Their names were Ananias and Sapphira. And we know from the first part of Acts chapter 5 that this group desiring not the blessing that comes from freely giving, they desired the blessing, the praise that comes uh, from, from those that see somebody giving. And so they, these two sold a field and they brought part of the proceeds to the church. Now, as we talked about already, Ananias and Sapphira did not have to do this. They did not have to sell their, their field. They didn't have to bring anything to the church. But what they did was they sold the field for a large amount. And they brought a small amount to the church. And they told the church they sold it for a large amount. So the problem was that they, not that they sold and brought and gave freely to the church. The problem was that they lied about the, how much they brought in from the sale of the field. And Peter says twice that you lied. You lied. Tim Keller says they wanted the credit and the honor in the community of being sacrificial givers, but they did not want to pay the literal cost for it. Again, they didn't have to sell the field, but they did so to gain approval of those around them, forgetting that God both sees and judges the thoughts of the heart. Psalm chapter 45 sums it up. In verse 21, the Bible says, for, Would God not discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Now, don't miss this. We're getting back to, to our text in Acts, but don't miss this. The first recorded sin in the life of the church was the sin of hypocrisy. It was the sin of hypocrisy. So let me ask you, is that surprising? No. You're probably not surprised at that. It, but it's something that we know hurts the church still today. There's a man named G.K. Chesterton, and he said this, the greatest argument against the truth of Christianity is the lives of Christians. He goes on. He says, even the most convinced Christians are often cast into doubt by the thought, if the gospel is true, how can so many supposed Christians be so dishonest and cruel? Something to think about. And God, in this instance, in Acts chapter 5, did something about the hypocrisy that's in his fledgling church. He purged it out. He put Ananias and Sapphira to death immediately. And this is a major event that took place in the life of the church. This is a major event, and it's shaken up quite a number of people. And yet, despite this, the church is growing exponentially. Despite the Spirit's dangerous holiness... New believers are still coming forward. So that's why verse 13 says, Nobody joined them. The people held them in high esteem. People feared them. But at the same time, new members are coming in. God is reaching out to others. And the church is growing. The church is multiplying. And here, one thing that I think is really cool, Luke stops taking, taking count of those that are coming into the church. Luke stops recording a number. And other times in the book of Acts, we see Luke says, and thousands were added this day. 5,000 was added this day. But right, right here, Luke just says, multitudes. We're done taking count. Multitudes of people came. Lots of people. Multitudes were added, both men and women. And then look what's also taking place. This is where it gets really cool. It gets really crazy. Verse 15, the Bible says, multitudes were added, both men and women. Verse 15 so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats 
that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, this might seem strange initially, but remember, a supernatural God can do supernatural things whenever he wants to. We need to remember that nothing is impossible with God. God can heal through a shadow. There's nothing that you have going on right now that God can't take care of. Nothing's impossible with God. This also tells us something about those apostles that God is working through. It tells us that the Holy Spirit is so powerfully manifesting himself in and through people like Peter that those who only came near him experienced the healing of the Holy Spirit. Those who are only nearby. And again, this is not something brand new to the book of Acts. This is something that has already taken place in Scripture. Think about the life of Jesus in Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, we see a woman was healed by simply touching Jesus' garment. Simply touching a piece of clothing that Jesus had on, a woman was healed. And as we'll see later on in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 19, a simple handkerchief that Paul had was carried far from Paul, and it was used to heal somebody who was very sick. This is further proof that the Lord is stepping in through his spirit. He's intervening through signs and wonders for the advance of his kingdom. It's a cool text, and it's a short text, but it leads us to ask those two questions that we talked about earlier in our time together. Regarding signs and wonders... Has God always worked this way? Has God, is, or is this something new to the book of Acts? Has God always done signs and wonders? Well, the short answer is yes. Again, remember John MacArthur's quote. It should come as no surprise if the God who supernaturally created the universe should choose at times to supernaturally intervene in it. God has been doing incredible things throughout all of Scripture. God's been doing incredible things since the beginning of time. Creation itself was a supernatural act. The, the end of the earth, of all things, is going to be a supernatural act. It only makes sense that God is going to continue acting supernaturally between those two events. Think about throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, throughout parts of the New Testament, we see God working through the weather, he works through storms, he works through sending fire from the sky, he works through rain when there's drought. I think God still does that today. We see that God works through his Holy Spirit. We see God gives life and takes life. People were brought back from the dead in the Old Testament. We see that God would cause idols to literally fall and, and bow before him. God supernaturally works. But God also works through created elements. See, in the Old Testament, one of my favorite passages is in the Exodus when God splits the sea and Israel walks through on dry land. I can't imagine walking with walls of water staying in place on either side of me. I can't imagine that. God speaks to someone through a donkey. God shuts a lion's mouth. Daniel chapter 6, verse 27 sums all of this up nicely. The, the Bible says in Daniel 6, 27 says... He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So God has always worked supernaturally because that's his character. God is supernatural. So regarding signs and wonders, does God still work in this way? Yes. The answer is yes. But it's yes with a caveat. God still works in this way. God still can do whatever it is that he wants to do. But these signs, these wonders, these miracles, I don't think they're as common as what God did when he worked in this part of, of history in the New Testament, in the book of Acts. Now, you might ask why. why. Why wouldn't God perform signs and wonders just as much as he did here in the book of Acts, here through in the Gospels, here through in the life of the early church? Well, the first reason is because unlike those believers, you and I 
have the full canon of Scripture. We have everything that God has inspired through His Spirit. No more, no less. We have everything that God wants us to know and reveal about Himself right here. We've got it all. And because we have that, we don't need a visible sign from the Lord in order to grow because we've got His living and active Word right here so that we can do just that, so that we can come to know the Lord, so that we can grow in our walk with the Lord, so that we can share the Lord with others. We don't have to have a sign to have somebody believe. The Bible says just tell them the Word. Tell them the good news. We've got the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God at our disposal so that the Lord can speak to us and through us. So what do we need to do with that? We need to read our Bibles. We need to read our Bibles. I found these graphics just this week. Look at, look at this graphic right here. Look at this graphic. If you put all of these together, it takes the average reader, somebody who reads at an, a, quote, average pace, it would take an average reader 72 hours to read the Bible cover to cover. 72 hours. Now, look on this next slide. In our country today, on average, someone in the United States spends a little over two hours per day on social media and up to four hours per day in front of a screen, whether that be a video game, a television, uh, something, something like that. So if that person, that average reader, replaced just two and a half of those six hours per day with reading the Bible, they could read the Bible in a month. If, you just, if the average American would just cut out social media, according to this, they could read the Bible in a little over a month. Do you wish you had more wonder about God? Do you have questions about life and faith? Why you're here? What your purpose is? What's God's will for you? The answers are here. You don't need something supernatural to come and take and, and show you the answer. God has supernaturally given us the answer right here. Even being so specific in his text to say, this is the will of God. And the answer for that is your sanctification, that you grow in your knowledge, your understanding of him. You're, you're looking more like him. So does God still work in this way today? Signs and wonders? Of course he does. Of course he does. But he primarily speaks through his word right now. So this might lead you to ask, well, why are there so many signs and wonders in the New Testament then? Aren't, aren't we a, a New Testament church? Why are there so many signs and wonders in the New Testament and not so many today as you're saying? I think the answer is because if you look at what's taking place in the New Testament you see a spiritual battle, a cosmic battle taking place. The book of Ephesians tells us that the world is under the prince of the power of the air. And what's taking place in the book of Acts, what's taking place in the Gospels, is God invading this territory that's been run and controlled by Satan for so long. He's launching an all-out battle into enemy territory. And there's a, the enemy is putting up resistance. That's why you see so many demons in the book of Acts and in the Gospels. That's why you see so much demonic activity uh, really focused in right here. It's because there is a battle that's unseen taking place in the background and is being brought to the foreground on numerous occasions of taking, taking place. It's incredible. God is reclaiming what is his right here in the book of Acts. God is the church is going forth. The gates of hell are not prevailing against the advance of the church and the advance of God's kingdom. And just like we do with Jesus, and Jesus would perform a sign, he'd perform a miracle, and people would want to be able to, to mimic or see that sign again, see that miracle again, and they would miss the giver. I think we do the same thing today. We ask for signs and miracles and, and wonders to take place in our lives, these spiritual wonders that we see recorded in Scripture, and we miss what God has already given us, telling us all we need to know about Him. John MacArthur, he backs this point up. He says that the gifts 
of signs and healings and tongues and interpretation of tongues were sign gifts that belonged to the apostles and prophets for a certain era of church history to, conform, to confirm the word. These individuals would perform a sign or a miracle and then talk about Jesus, which would confirm the validity of their message. And Scripture backs this up. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, the Bible says, It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to His will. And I think we do good to remember that last, those last few words, distributed according to His will. Does God still work through signs and wonders? Does God still do miraculous acts across the world today? Absolutely He does. But He does so when He wills to do so. And I think God is still doing so in areas around the world where there's much more spiritual warfare taking place, where the, where the word is not as prevalent or as distributed. And I think God still performs these things around the world in areas that are kind of like the New Testament. There's a there's spiritual battle taking place. The gospel is going forth and penetrating areas that have been dark for thousands and thousands of years. So to conclude, I'd like to suggest a book to you. A book I think you would love to read. It's called The Insanity of God. And it's a well-documented case of a missionary who's in some very dark places across the world. And he's talking about the things that he has seen God do in the background. Some of them are quite miraculous that, that bring about faith, that they cause people to believe, that they strengthen people's faith. And I would, I would encourage you, if, if this is something that interests you, if you want to know how does God continue to work through signs and miracles here today, I'd encourage you to pick up this book, The Insanity of God. You'll, you'll really, really enjoy it. So if you remember our point, wonders cause us to wonder. My encouragement for you this week is that you will take some time to see the things that God is doing in your life in the lives of others and around you. And take some time to reflect on that and let that cause you to wonder and let your thoughts be rich and deep about the God who created you, who loves you, and who died for you. Let's pray together. Father, I'm grateful for this time. Lord, I'm grateful for the testimony that you've given us through your word. And Lord, I pray that your spirit will go out before it. I pray that you'll encourage us, everybody who sees, hears, listens to this, myself, you'll help us to dive deep and realize how much time we spend on things that aren't profitable and help us to direct and redirect that time towards your word. So, Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this word that we have. We thank you that you built your church and we are standing here because of what you did in the book of Acts. And we ask all this in the great name of King Jesus.